Hello everyone, today we talk about Marius 5 consulates of 104 to 100 BC uh, so discussing mainly the Cimbrian invasion then the, um, the issues between uh, Marius and Saturninus and Glauca and I already made um, a video about the uh, latter event a couple of years ago so this will uh, connect uh, with it and also in part the um, Marian religion right connected with his reforms and political um, activity and objectives uh, in general um, revolving around his um, bow at the Magna Mater that is Kubala at Pessinus and the broader meaning that this has in fact in in Roman history and what was really Marius um, you know doing this for that of course remains just a, a theory but ne nevertheless um, you know, a, um, a consistent one uh, in the struggle between the Apollonian and the Dionysian so eventually what is will be called later Ciceronian times the Optimates and the Populares which however are not this uh, rigidly distinct category also from an ideological point of view and this is the point of it all right that helps understanding also contemporary policy that uh, we're looking at an elite essentially that is pursuing the same goals just with different means and that's what those two parties really meant in practice uh, Marius example is quite significant because normally he you know embodied a bit the the model of a popularist uh, in, you know conceptually and also uh, imitatively for his, um, you know, successors, we can call them like that. Uh, Marius, with his military reforms, as you know, opens definitely to the entrance of the proletarians in the army without um, essentially a class distinction. Uh, it was not actually a, you know, a, a radical change. Um, it because the the situation had already come to that, right? So most of what is attributed to Marius which is primarily a political reform not a military one in fact even the military details are first of all unverified but secondly are obviously as most for military reformers they, they didn't actually change anything this is valid um, throughout all history um, because such mechanisms already happened within the armies without you know some someone waking up one day and deciding, oh, what, you know, I found this, now, now everybody will follow it, and all, all the soldiers, oh my god, I never thought about this, really? Um, and that's how mentally deficient contemporary people are in looking at history, but uh, that's a problem that we have to cope with every day. In any case, um, uh, Marius role here um, embodies definitely that kind of popular, uh, and even populistic uh, instrumentalization, that, however, uh, as, as you will see with Saturninus episode, um, is unsustainable on a long time. And when you realize what really occurred also with the, uh, with the Gens Julia, that, as you know, was married also into uh, uh, Marius' uh, entourage, think about the Gens Aurelia, etc. Et we see at the, the top quality elite, arist blood aristocratic, um, uh, you know, cream of Rome. Right, so the ultra elitistic one that, however, also used that um, say pol political legacy to obtain its purpose, which was the affirmation of the golden age of a universal empire ruling on the entire globe, with uh, you know with with a print caps that had a massive statue of Apollo, so the full um, you know uh, mirror of the aristocratic hierarchy of the Indo-European establishment uh, imposed on the world and so uh, that tells you really how really th these experiments end right always remember that uh, populism is a declaration of cultural inferiority right and the only thing that populism can give is the mass in that if rightly and brutally disciplined um, and used can of course be a mean to an end but it's never the end right people in history basically are worthless uh, in, in many ways uh, from a qualitative point of view and um, what is established also thanks to them is mostly 
through labor, not through intelligence, really. And every revolution, historically speaking, shows this quite beautifully. Uh, but aside from my conservative, uh, it's more, it's a sort of traditionalistic, imperialistic universalism. And um, as you know, that's what my channel is fundamentally about and has come to, uh, unavoidably, learning history. We pass to the, to the quid, in fact, um, which, which is the Cimbrian Teutonic so-called uh, invasions. So uh, around 120 BC, uh, these barbarian hordes of the Cimbri and the Teutons had moved from the Jutland Peninsula and surrounding areas, of course, gathering also other tribes along the way, other groups along the way. And this prefigures, in a sense, uh, much of the, the movements that would have been proper of the so-called migration era later. Right, that uh, evidences, of course, that these um, primitive populations of Germanic stock migrating from the the far north um, were w would have been moving, would have been expanding. Right? This is a bit the light motive, also triggered by the Cimbrian times, where the fear towards the Germans was not extinguished in Rome fundamentally until um, Caesar's success, or at least, you know, this is part of the Julian propaganda, as uh, Marius had already significantly um, resolved the problem by de facto exterminating um, the entire the entire problem itself. Um, and, of course, these are, um, you know, broader, you know, accomplishments of Yes, primitive peoples in front of a civilization that they were quite wary of, and that, you know, whatever the reasons were for their uh, move, uh, surely do not hint at a particularly, you know, s steady, secure situation. Um, talking about the Cambrians and the Teutons is naturally important because. It, they were a big thing. I mean, as we will see now, they roamed most of Europe fundamentally and passing from 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 uh, the, almost the Balkans to 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 the Iberian Peninsula from Gaul to Italy um, and so uh, coming from from uh, again modern day Denmark era and, and so um, the, uh, the 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 question here is why of course they were doing that and the simple answer is that they were seeking for a new opportunity right to settle somewhere where they thought the local Polities were uh, would have, after all, accepted their settlement in search, of course, and they were in search of, you know, fertile, advanced, prosperous areas. The the Celts had been doing this for centuries, uh, also against Rome at a point, um, but as you know, by this time they were uh, being subjugated both by the Romans and the Germans. That when they migrated uh, throughout this episode, for example, in Gaul, exposed dramatically both to Rome and other Germans because the Swabi will try to invade St. Gaul as you know and that to what is triggered formally Caesar's conquest uh, of, of the region that remained Roman for half of a millennium and it was one of the greatest if not actually the greatest success of Romanization provincially speaking some settlement um, the Celtic penetration in the Iberian Peninsula had been consistent especially in the north and in the center. Uh, also, the Danubian Celts are often uh, overlooked. The Galatians are a bit the ones that scored uh, the biggest hit, even though they eventually settled in, in Asia Minor without too much, uh, let's say, trouble after the event. I mean, the, nobody was particularly worried about the, uh, the Galatians being there. It was just uh, another power among the ones that existed there uh, regionally. Um, the, the Germans were another wave at this point uh, that we also, as you know, trace in a kind of a, you know, ethnographic sense from the, from the Roman sources, right? We, we that speak of these various peoples that in fact are also uh, named as such, right? And uh, about whom also the ethnic background has been um, was ethnic background has been discussed, right? Some believe, for example, that uh, an important part of them were, were Celts, but again, yes, uh, 
you know, this is historiographically deemed to be controversial, but, you know, I mean, what if you look at Central Europe, like, what's, what's exactly the difference between uh, Celts and Germans, even assuming that these peoples existed as such? I mean, they were basically the same peoples. I mean, uh, all over Europe, because do you think that the Dacians were somewhat, you know, in what did they differ practically, even the Italics or other Indo-European stocks? What, what do you think that, you know, they, they truly, uh, you know, distinguished themselves for? Uh, and, of course, um, modern ethnopopulism, that, of course, is the expression of that aforementioned cultural inferiority, looks exclusively at a sort of, you know, ethno-nationalistic delusion, which is a collectivistic and socialistic uh, mental uh, disorder, that must believe that, you know, since there are countries with peoples and names and, you know, passports and citizenships, uh, you know, it... 2,000 years ago, there were peoples that are basically the same and that they were that, right? And just because, you know, they were called one name or another. Um, trying to distinguish in areas like uh, the frontier between the, this, the broader northern culture and, say, most of Central Europe and saying, ah, this is Celt or this is German, uh, it's just not an intelligent uh, thing to do, right? in case you didn't notice. Uh, before. Uh, and so, of course, yes, there was a broader blend. These were tribal, uh, essentially militarized peoples that were, you know, prone also to carry out such, um, you know, such movements, such migrations. Uh, also, uh, coagulating many other groups in the process that joined for the simple taste of, you know, looting uh, until they could, because they could still abandon everything coming back to the north, as it did happen in, in many cases, also in the case of the Cimbrians and the Tehadans. Um It's not just that there were chunks of them that had remained in the Jutland, but also after they were crushed by the Romans, they came back, were there, right? And it was kind of natural, and that tells you also how, uh, let's say, politically fluid reality really is at all times. Right, this or uh, there is not a like today's times like an entrenched kind of okay. We are just uh, you know that people living there, uh, and uh, we will always remain there. Th these peoples didn't really care about uh, the land, right? The land belonged to the lesser people that worked for them, right? This is the entire point of also the broader ethos of the time. Rulers rule over the world; they don't rule over a piece of dirt piece of dirt just serves to uh, for for slaves that have been crushed in battle to feed the guy that yes is is kind of that physically needy because it still belongs to a decayed race from the divine one but still literally sows with the tip of, the, of his spear as Atenaeus says beautifully about uh, the an alleged you know statement of a Celtic warrior that the fact that you know his shield and spear were, were everything right where were his rule where his command were his uh, plow, right? Because uh, other people obeyed to feed him. Uh, and this was the kind of, of attitude, except these people lived at the outskirts of civilization, and there is a reason why civilization is civilization. Um, and thus, there is not really much that the whole enterprise could, uh, could do, especially against a nascent power like Rome, which exactly at this point, by the way, was unlocking the tremendous uh, the full uh, demographic potential that it had, especially through in fact the Marian reform, and so the endless enlistment of a booming uh, demographically and economically uh, Italian peninsula that was taking over the entire Mediterranean and soon also Central European regions. Um, so we already talked about the Roman conquest of Gaul, so I will not digress on the broader order of things. Let's say, but the Cimbrian migrations were an important challenge to pose to that. Uh, broader view, right? We we cannot really think that the average Kimbran or Teuton really thought or cared or, you know, even knew by a certain degree the the entirety, you know, of, of the of the Roman, uh, you know, design and whatever. But they believed essentially the same thing. That is to say, they want they have to conquer the world, um, except they hardly knew about each other. You can argue that this was the first true, in fact, meeting between the Romans and the Germans, as, of course, um, the Italian Peninsula and Central Europe were in deep 
that were deeply connected uh, historically. Uh, the same italics had migrated from there. The um, the Etruscans had contributed to development also, you know, uh, the full Tark um, uh, script uh, in the north. There were intense trade relations. So of course, these peoples knew each other. They even understood each other's cults and, and ideas and so on. It's just that uh, the Again, this video is not about the Cumbrian migration per se, but, you know, the reasons why these peoples would move sometimes were just, um, you know, this broader pressure they had locally and the the opportunities that, that were present elsewhere. Uh, and this seemed a moment uh, worth uh, exploiting, right? And there was much about this migration was successful, including the fact that the Romans were severely defeated by the Germans at this point before Marius kicked in. Um, this especially took form in the Roman slaughter of Arausio, today's Orange, and we will see it a, a little bit. Um, this was a fault of the Roman command, basically uh, was fighting two, as two different armies at a time, and the Cambrians took advantage of that, defeating the two chunks in detail. But this is a bit like Adrianople, this is kind of total... Uh, command and competence that brought the, the entire thing to, to collapse, despite the army was actually quite fit and expression definitely of a of, of that specific um, advancement in military culture. But as we often say in our military historical videos, uh, we're talking about the second, um, the end, for second verse, where you want to approach the thing from century BC. And when you look at that. Um, you realize that the world was not that different. I mean, if you pick uh, Roman legionnaires and Germanic warriors, it, they they fought in, after all, similar ways, right? In, in the essence of it all, right? And it's, again, mostly our contemporary mindset that has to stress the fact that, you know, there was this deep deterministic difference about things that can happen. Again, politics is that fluid. Right, everything can take a different um, shape and form according to to what happens. Right, the Romans could have won at Arausio, and Marius' career would have been very different. And so, Roman history, and so world history, and so who knows what would have even happened? The entire, um, you know, Caesarian Augustan legacy would have been different. It would may have actually not existed. Um, and so we are looking at broader forces that, of course, at that point were heavily in favor of Rome, but at the same time, if situations that could be exploited, as actually also the following years would show. I made a video about the social war. Um, we never talked about the slave rebellions, including Spartacus, but, but those really showed how you know, complex and uh, the, the political and social reality really is, and how much geopolitics does not exist. Um, and how uh, the the entire point here is being wired to those universal standards and realizing by which degree this protagonist had approached them or not, and, and thus how far could they push uh, at the moment and uh, in practice. So these Germans migrated first towards the Danube, that was uh, generally speaking the first, uh, the, the main divide between especially the most developed, also Central European areas, um, also the Celtic lands that in the process were not happy at all of the this, this Germanic movements. Um, they wandered for a few years and since they could not overcome the resistance of the Balkan peoples, they were quite savage and also unhappy that somebody would knock at their door, they headed for the northern border of Italy that had been, as you know, a uh, formerly Celtic or Celticized area that the Romans had been colonizing now from uh, a century uh, or so. And, and the um, approach of hundreds of thousands of barbarians in arms, right, and we're talking about a uh, probably much larger group considering that they did migrate together with the entire populations, right, so this was a full migration. Uh, made the danger serious and urgent, right? Because these forces could disrupt a great part of what the Romans had been um, accomplishing. Just um, 
in a for for the local communities to 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 move in a in an autonomistic sense because they didn't like the Germans but they didn't like the Romans either. Um, in in this time uh, we will see the Cimbrian War in detail at some point. But as you know, there were three Roman defeats, right? Uh, some other peoples such as the the Noriki had asked for Roman help. Uh, Rome counted much on the relation also with these peoples because they were important for their, for example, metal imports. The same famous Calbus Noricum was used for the Roman gladi. And as we were saying before, the worst disaster for Rome was caused in 105 BC by the disagreement between the two commanders that were the proconsul Quintus Servilius Caepio and the consul Cnaeus Manlius Maximus. In Arausio Range, the barbarians were able to beat the two halves of the Roman army separately, which uh, suffered the most ruinous defeat after Cannae. Yes, if you wonder what is the bloodiest Roman defeat, not necessarily the most uh, relevant from a political, strategical, or even tactical point of view, but literally the ones in which more Romans were killed in Roman history, this was the Battle of Arausio. Right. This is important to remember. Um, and this shows, generally speaking, also considering the aforementioned uh, Marian reforms and the fact that Rome at this point didn't have any any recruitment problem in practice. At least this, this, this battle actually accelerated the full catalyzation of, of the reforms and so surpassing the problem entirely. Uh, they could send in the meat grinder tens of thousands of Legionaries, right? These were at this point mainly uh, Romano-Italic uh, troops. They, they were mostly Italic, telling the truth, than even Romans. As you know, there was always a larger um, Saki complement that, uh, in fact, paid uh, even a much higher tribute of blood um, than than the Romans. And again, I made that video about the social war that tells you how the thing really was, except. At by this time, and actually already since the, the Second Punic War, um, these peoples were undistinguishable, right? There was literally no difference of any form and trace between a Roman legionnaire and an Italic legionnaire. Yes, we can make the case that maybe there is some kind of style of, you know, decoration of arms and armor that was more present, I don't know, in Apulia as opposed to Etruria or this kind of things, but uh, in terms of political and military culture, these were identical Roman legions, and that's why the, the social war was so uh, pernicious, because essentially it was a civil war between the, the same, uh, same Romano-Italics. Um, and the Italians, we can't say, because as you know, there weren't just Italics, um, including the Romans, there were, um, there were Etruscans, there were uh, peoples of Illyrian stock, of, of also Celtic background, the Ligurians, uh, etc. But this is not important now. Uh, in any case, the Cambrian threat was really powerful because actually the Germans didn't. And it, it, it's a there is a mythology around that, that stems from the same Marian propaganda, right? Because the the threat posed to Italy uh, was concrete, but the Germans didn't really step into that uh, immediately or fully or, you know, with full determination. Actually, they, they split in different groups. This was also um, a great cause of their own ruin later on. Um, and they were, in fact, defeated in detail, but there were really many. So the Romans did meet them at some point in, you know, equal numbers or even inferior ones. Uh, and uh, the, the point being, though, is that m most of these Germans were feared to invade Italy. And this is what the Marian propaganda fueled uh, as an idea, even though the Germans mostly remained from, from the other side of the Alps, when they even they could move in, because Marius wanted to push the Senate um, through his populistic leverage to, uh, in fact, trigger fully his, his reforms, that meant practically that uh, this Roman warlords, uh, as they had been called by this point, could monopolize further um, the internal politics by hiring masses of men that at that point had literally nothing to lose because these were mostly proletarians, right? The, um, the Romano-Italic 
peasant um, soldier had uh, significantly impoverished during the second century BC. There had been the recruitment crisis, especially um, for the Boers in the Barian Peninsula. Part of the problem was, was true also in Numidia, where, as we will see now, Marx had been involved. Uh, these were a bit Roman Vietnams, except they, they won in the end. Uh, but and they drained in an enormous amount of resources for for countries that the Romans objectively didn't give a damn about. I mean, it, most of the the Barren Peninsula. We're not talking about the media were really, um, you know, mentally distant from Rome. Like they they didn't care about them. Rome had been successful in as much as it had, of course, uh, essentially a Germanized the Hellenistic world de facto. So the the richest coastal lands of the Mediterranean, and that's why at, at this point fundamentally it had not been a true continental expansion that is said the Romans will be forced uh, to accomplish in, in Gaul, in Spain, uh, and even in other land masses. Think about Britain. Uh, they, they attempted it with Germany, as you know, you know how it ended. Um, and uh, the, the broader uh, pattern here was, okay, we just are milking the fat cow of, of the Atlantic world, like, what do we care about this rather barbarians in the interland? But, as you know, much of uh, Western European identity actually stems from the eventual uh, Romanization of the West through the military instruments and resources that the Marian reform rendered fully available, right? It would have likely happened, also w without Marius, it's just that he did it, and so we remember him, and also for the, in fact, quite, quite effective use that he made of them. Um, Marius had been involved in the war in the media, as you know, um, as uh, an officer of uh, Metellus that, uh, you know, here it's difficult even to distinguish history from propaganda, of course, because n there is no such thing like uh, free thought in antiquity, or, you know, even up you know, what, what's free thought exactly, even today? Nobody really understands, really knows. Um, the, um, the, but there is a, still a deep political meaning in all of this. Of course, Metellus wanted part of the glory for, uh, for him. He was actually probably operating according to, to effective strategical patterns. That is also what Marius found out the hard way after having been cocky about his, you know, um, potential that would have captured um, Jugurtha you know, with half of Metellus' forces um, when he took command uh, himself. Um, it's but the same rivalry that would emerge with Sulla that was, as you know, his own officer, and they had had a quarrel regarding the Imperium, um, given that Bocchus of Mauritania had uh, captured Jugurtha after having actually fought uh, himself against the same Romans, um, handed him over to, to Sulla as a uh, lieutenant, of Marius, and Marius was consul at the time. Um, so there was a quarrel between the two that were different people. Uh, as you know, Marius was a homo novus. He was probably an equestrian. We don't even know what precisely, but that's the likely. He was actually very rich. He was of this kind of Italian rather than Roman background. That's also quite significant. Sulla instead is the most traumatically violent aristocratic idea that you can imagine. Um, he was also loved by the troops in his own uh, aristocratic fashion, as um, Marius was also in that kind of uh, companion drinking fashion with with the troops. But um, the point was, vus imperium was that, because according to, of course, the the institutional rules of Rome, Marius detained that because uh, the Senate had handed um, it over him. Except Sulla started thinking that he was the one, because you know, after all, the enemy had uh, been given. This was something also that the Romans cared about much in the wake of Alexander's legacy, that you know, true emperors um, do not even need to fight. Right? Because if you are right, uh, peoples will just obey to you. And if they don't, it's because you're not enough. Right? And uh, All the Roman uh, aristocracy was overly exalted with this imperial thing, and it's also much of the reason why they actually accomplished an empire. And except at this point, uh, there was an enormous competition for the same, and that's where the Republic was becoming too crowded and its institutional mechanisms too, uh, too delicate, considering the, the powers that were being unlocked, especially through 
this ever greater military involvement to the necessity of uh, deploying uh, overseas and so on. Um, so Marius, uh, just after the war in Numidia, had been already elected consul by 104, right? He appeared to be um, in the, t in, in, say, in the wake of this Cimbrian threat, the only one who could um, secure the Narbonensis, so southwestern Gaul, and Italy herself from this common danger that, after all, was upsetting really a bit all the, the Romans um, in this regard. And, and yes, there, there was a significant threat of this kind because, as we were saying before, the Germans were interested mostly in this more, more productive areas, right? Especially the Celtic world that they could have hardly settled anywhere in actually. Uh, in the Mediterranean, um, but as it would happen later with Ariovistus, um, the same um, the same Central European populations were looking at Gaul. Uh, it was really something more developed than than their lands. So in fact, Ariovistus is also kind of a Celtic sounding rather than a Germanic one name. Uh, but again, what's the the scientificity in the division? Uh, in any case, um, it was important and crucial to show the peoples over which Rome ruled that, of course, uh, the the Imperium was Rome's, right? This, this is a bit the reason why during the recruitment crisis, Rome had uh, raised to the ground um, Carthage. Uh, that was not a threat anymore. Actually, the Roman knights made a lot of money with Carthage, but they, they needed a scapegoat of some sort. They, they needed to show the Mediterranean that if Rome wanted, they could have simply left no trace uh, of such a civilization. That's the same reason why they plundered Corinth, for example. There was actually, the Mediterranean was not very impressed by Carthage, uh, because after all, it was kind of a, a Phoenician exception. But when they the, the Romans looted um, one of the greatest capitals of Hellenism, like Corinth, that, that was a, a massive trauma for the entire Hellenistic world because they realized that the Romans, that after all the Hellenes had been forced to, to accept as rulers and, you know, trying to negotiate, conferring them this kind of almost Alexandrine uh, character, realized that uh, the Romans uh, were absolutely ruthless and uh, they didn't give a damn, of course, about anyone but themselves. Uh, and again, that's also actually a, a pretty effective way uh, of, of ruling when you, you have at least the capacity of, of, of doing so. Um, and it was just a, a political calculation. W what is interesting about Rome is that it, it fueled and flattered all the tyrannic nature of the, uh, say, the tyrannic governments of the Hellenistic world, right? Tyrannic means literally tyrannoi. Um, uh, we're talking about leaders of Hellenic states that had kind of a more aristocratic, uh, monarchic actually, way of rule and that looked at Rome and said, well, compared to the kind of more democratic Hellenic world, the, the Romans seem to be much more, uh, you know, competent um, in leadership than, than that other model is. It's, it's a bit... Uh, you know, Caesar criticizing Sulla for eventually abandoning dictatorship, saying, you know, Sulla nescisse literas, um, quid dictaturam deposuerit. And that's uh, a bit what we shouldn't be fooled by, in fact, as a concept, even regarding the populism of Marius. Marius probably did share consistently some of these uh, ideas, and we will see it better exactly in this Hellenistic monarchic sense in a in Pergamon where we'll explain later regarding to Pessinus why he went to honor to fulfill a, a vow contracted during the Cimbrian Wars um, with the Magna Mater uh, that is to say Kubale actually uh, in, um, in in that in that sanctuary now the um, uh, the, the Marian propaganda, as we were saying before, was fueling this idea that southern Gaul and northern Italy were under threat and so of the stabilization, which was again true, but it's not about 
how true that was, rather how we can measure this. And you know, the historiographical sources are oriented a bit in this regard and tend to, to, um, to they, they have an agenda, they tend to narrativize and to, even to dramatize sometimes. Um, Plutarch, for example, is pretty weird. It says things that were not really around in, in Roman policy in this, this context. But it surely was a major threat to Rome, and that had to be answered militarily. So the confidence placed in Marius' military prowess resulted um, in the extraordinary, uninterrupted re-election to the consulate until 100 BC. Uh, this was actually not the first time somebody was elected, even just a second time in a row as consul. This had already happened uh, during the Second Punic War with Quintus Fabius Maximus, that, as you know, had been entrusted, basically, command of the operations in Italy with that kind of actually inconclusive guerrilla that wasn't the one that pushed, actually, Hannibal away, except it was, say, the the standard pack thing to do, uh, if you wanted at least to contain him in the peninsula. Um, so, naturally, a lot of water had passed under the bridges, the, the Gracchi uh, had been massacred, I mean, the Republic at this point was dying um, and in general the situation seemed fit to confer to reconfirm actually uh, the consulship to to Marius um, as we were saying before since the barbarian multitude was divided the Teutons remained in in Gaul that where they had easier move right they really crossed it far and wide uh, the Gauls really didn't do much right this as we were saying before really showed all the weakness of these lands sometimes historically you um peoples don't have an idea of how much uh, a people a country an area really are until they they see it happen right um nobody before charles the eighth expedition thought that I don't, I don't know taking over italy at the end of the 15th century was would have been so easy um there were uh, naturally uh, maybe not a chance that we started that series about the world of the third coalition um regarding uh you know the the triggering of of course previous to that also the, the revolutionary uh model of, of army levy and organization so um what we're looking at here it, it's a bit comparable because probably nobody had understood to the fullest what you know the thing would have uh, ended uh like uh, for for Rome in in the just in the century to come, right? Because uh, that unlocking of the of the military resources that happened right now, right? All that the Marian reforms were was just politically saying, okay, before there is a, a census class for which you need to provide to to be recruited and to you know partly even contribute to your own through your your own equipment. The thing really didn't happen already from a long time. And actually, Roman troops received a salary since the time of the siege of Bay. So the Marian reform didn't really change anything, except now any restriction was was uh, eliminated. So if you were really a, a very poor person, you just wanted to enlist the army, uh, you didn't have to fit any other requirement. The reason why this had existed up to that point is that naturally, um, uh, going at, at war was a not just a duty, but a privilege. Right, the one of, of the freemen that is the nobleman, because in the in the European tradition every freeman is a noble, and that's what the Romans, of course, thought of, the, of, the, of their of their individual. Um, uh, in fact, uh, civitas, uh, optimo iure, and that's why that it was called like that, because really meant first and foremost that they were freemen, but they were, in fact, they they could bear arms, in uh, at least in in military expeditions and thus um, also profiting from that. Uh, this was a much more satellite reality now in which you know the army had been paid for by by the state and by actually this the, so the, the private already warlords and oligarchs of, of Roman politics. But this step right was uh, equating to completely open the dam and therefore putting in some so many military resources from again people that had nothing to lose um, to uh, higher match the stakes of power in Rome right and that's why 
you know, 100 years later, to was an empire, like in a, in a truly monarchic sense. Um, and so at this point, um, people were still thinking about the ideal of um, the the older the older system. I don't even call it the Republic because the Roman Republic never existed as such, right? The Res Publica, Populi Romani, was the just a broader concept, and it was actually the official name of the Roman Empire in the first place, even later on. But um, it's um, um, it, it was significant to expand such a uh, recruitment pool exactly in a moment in which the, the threat seemed so high. Right? Uh, the goals seemed uh, at this point hopelessly divided. This surely gave the Romans the 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 full evidence that those areas could be taken over. As you know, Caesar, half a century later, would have preferred actually to, to invade Dacia than Gaul. He contented himself with just a political objective um, and uh, the entire goal was taken over in only eight years. And and also because it had been already uh, infiltrated by the Germans starting from the Cum from Cumbrian time. Um, and even in Gaul, it was that kind of oligarchic problem that didn't want... Uh, it was a, a ruthless competition between the various tribes that were hegemonized by single... Uh, single leaders, kings if you want, that um, were always and constantly suspicious about each other. It was practically no political cohesion. Um, even the, the one that arrived uh, at the end of the Gallic Wars was, was not enough to, to defeat Rome um, in general because Caesar could also be defeated and killed on multiple occasions at the Gergovia and Alesia, etc. But uh, just the, the broader balance was in favor of the Romanization of Gaul sooner or later. Uh, just this happened that quickly, that fast. Um, and that's always kind of a sign, right? It, it's not a static objective that you just look at and say, well, you know, let's attack it and see what happens. It's, it's that world lives next to yours. It, it, it's made by people. And the elites understood that it would have been more advantageous, like it had already happened in the Hellenistic world, to be under Rome, that after all was interested in just stabilizing the region, making trade flow, and that, that was pretty much it. Then, you know, continuing with this, con uh, in fact, uh, endless instability that also uh, was exposing, in that case, the goals to, to much more ruthless and primitive rulers, such as the Germans. So, uh, as you understand, th th this is not really negotiable as a historical interpretation, because it's literally what happened and um, Rome had the upper hand and simply played that card and, and, and won right? without too many too many problems actually. Um, Marius proceeded thus to the new enlistments waiting for the opportune moment for the clash with the barbarians. Uh, at some point he just was on their tail Right, he just pressured them. Also, because the Germans were, say, less, uh, you know, uh, logistically and kind of um, uh, expert in also military engineering, that they, they had more difficulties than the Romans. Uh, they were, however, a formidable host, and thus uh, the same Marian legions had to be watchful. And um, Marius kept training soldiers, actually, actually lot of, lots of them, several tens of thousands that were needed just to, you know, garrison the, the, the broader region, and those were, again, Marian clients, as you understand. Uh, he also kept, he, as you know, Marius was a disciplinarian, so he kept his troops in training with useful and tiring works, such as the excavation of a navigable canal that connected the Rhone with the sea, the so-called Fossae Marianae, that would uh, remain as an important infrastructure in the empire later on, and that was quite useful for facilitating the military operations, uh, the, the crossing 
um, uh, of the same Roman army and uh, also providing actually instead with an obstacle for, for the Germans. And this already, th this kind of works already show you what the Roman army was, right? Um, what already Roman civilization had come to conquering more uh, with the Dolabra than with uh, the Roman pickaxe than with the Gladius uh, itself. Uh, there was a superior military engineering culture. The Roman legionnaire is best described as a soldier, as an assault engineer, right? The Roman legionnaires were capable of fighting and of building um, at the same time, right? Under enemy fire, surrounded in terrifying situations. But when you read the Gallic Wars, you have actually the, the best, uh, you know, picture of that, right? That, that, that wasn't Caesar's, right? That is properly the century old. Roman military culture at work that Caesar as a politician lent to war knew how to, to, to use brilliantly, but it was already deeply ingrained in the Roman order, discipline, training, uh, and it's something that goes very far more than, say, equipment or uh, material wealth. Um, this is actually proven in conditions of terrible material deprivation such as in, in enemy land surrounded just like in Gaul and more and also you know war is not made often with in luxury anyway so there is always um, a very balanced odd with the enemy most of the time and these these all these works this this dramatic capacities had an edge right for what was now a fully professional army that is also Yet the other thing that, uh, in, in, with enormous resources, of course, invested in collective training, really makes a superior military culture in all in the history of mankind. Uh, Marius in this, of course, invested a lot because it meant really to, you know, to, to be remunerated with further power from these people that were also to be paid with new land plots that would be. Uh, politically designed uh, by the same Marius considered that even though he wasn't a question um, he was very very rich right so he uh, so much that his family could pay also for the, uh, the I think this uh, multiple consulates of his own brother at the same time so private resources mean really a lot the Senate paid through the agrarium certain amount of of, of 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 money in fact of, of gold um, for for recruiting the same legions right that's how it practically happened except these roman warlords especially after Rome, the, the marian reform would invest ever more of their massive private assets uh, for competing against one another i mean the top evident uh, example is the one of, of starting with the first triumvirate uh, so the Battle of 102 BC at Aquae Sextiae was conducted with great tactical skill by Marius, uh, who lured the Teutons into a narrow valley, so, uh, bypassing them with cavalry and flanking them so that they had no escape. Um, and uh, he slaughtered them. And what I mean that is, you know, talking about at least several tens of thousands of killed. Um, this this was um, repeated fundamentally for all the other engagements which the Marian legions were, were victorious against these peoples again that were moving en masse so for women, children there are the examples of the uh, Teutonic women that uh, you know killed themselves rather than falling in the hand of the Romans because they would have been enslaved uh, and uh, many were enslaved anyway and um, this, this this entire presence was dissipated. The Cimbri had headed for Italy and were preparing to descend into the Po Valley through the uh, the Adige Valley, right, the Brenner Pass, the same one that the Germans would use during the Middle Ages for their Italian expedition. And the other consul of 102 BC, Quintus Lutatius Catulus, uh, was also you know a, a great. Um, exponent of Roman literature, a learned man, uh, and uh, a good example of that uh, broader aristocracy that was really making Ro the Roman Roman civilization. On that occasion, failed, however, militarily speaking, 
as he let at least the barbarians spread across the Venetian plain. So it's at this point that Marius arrived in 101 to resolve the situation, joining his army with that of Catullus, and at the Campi Raudi near Vercellae in southern Venetia, rather than in the locality of the same name in, uh, in Transpadan. Um, the Cimbri were defeated, right? Tens of thousands began fell in the field or were made slaves. Uh, Marius was hailed as the savior of the fatherland, the founder of Rome after Romulus and Camillus, right? And this was naturally what we uh, get from his mm, propaganda, but what was truly believed for many Romans that, as we will see now, were in socially and economically precarious conditions with their uh, rights being eroded by the oligarchy and so on. And, and so they thought that this war hero could help, um, that there was a homo novus coming also from this Italian background could, you know, um, in fact, uh, correspond the the with with these instances, and um, touching also on the Italic issue, and an improvement of the mass conditions through their manpower, right? But naturally, the thing was done in a much more um, aristocratically mediated way, right? These these people, after all, had all ended um, under some pattern of sort who was connected with broader uh, broader elite that again as popularis as they would be called later would make leverage on that kind of mass force rather than uh, that was at, at the end of the day the same base of the um, of the optimatus later on right it's just um, it was conceived in in at least approach from different directions and uh, the policy was enacted with, with different means uh, depending on the the degree of the fact of loyalty of the same mass of the same client tales um, the, the danger posed by the barbarian hordes had been felt seriously um, it, it also much propaganda had been made to revoke the terror of the ancient Gallic invasion of Rome that had, in that sense, uh, made uh, Marius closer to to Camillus, uh, and so the the ransomer of Roman honor, um, and, and so again the 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 cultural and traditional mythology was reinforced in a populistic direction. Um, this was also uh, a criticism to the ineptitude of the previous commanders. Uh, Marius' organizational skills were objectively enormous. He really carried out a fantastic um, operational concert, let's say, to, to repel the migration of, of these Germanic peoples that seem even more... Uh, even more savage than than anything that Rome had ever seen before, and so these baths of blood uh, uh, re-exalted the imperium and also the protagonists of those victories. So the uh, the new Marian army, composed largely by proletarians. A again, as we were saying before, there was not actually a radical change in the social extraction of the Roman legionaries. Uh, between the, the, the before and the after of the Marian reform. Um, but still, this new military organization was um, carried out by a leader that embodied that kind of uh, broader popular policy. Uh, in fact, uh, the Marian victories, while extremely uh, celebrated by, by the people, were not uh, conferring Marius uh, a great internal support. As a matter of fact, he found himself actually also, you know, opposed by by the establishment because the Senate was rightfully suspicious about this man's 
uh, ambition, especially considering that he was not one of them. He was just our Monovos, as others that had emerged in, in the previous generation and that uh, were normally aiming at this kind of cancerial dignity, but uh, didn't quite, um, you know, hadn't quite be been so powerful like Mars now really was, having won both in Numidia and against the Germans. So the Marian Consulate of 100 BC was characterized by problems of internal politics. The so-called, uh, in fact, popularis, at least, again, it's a Ciceronian age definition, right? You can argue saying the, the Democrats as opposed to the aristocrats. That, that's also wrong, because there was no democracy in Rome that never existed. It was just an oligarchic um, establishment and uh, again it was mostly uh, the difference mostly laid in which tools you were using to make leverage on, uh, on the rest public um, and uh, this this faction however um, drew inspiration from the celebrated triumphs by the way in Rome of their most illustrious uh, exponent to oppose the aristocracy broadly men this was perceived, in fact, as quite dangerous by, by the Senate. The tribune of the plebs, Lucius Apuleius or Apuleius Saturninus and the praetor Gaius Serpilius Glaucia joined forces at this point to carry out an anti-senatorial and pro-popular program. Um, they were essentially carrying out an, an extremistic populistic policy uh, Marius didn't like these people, um, but um, they were the only ones that could provide him with political support of any sort, so they began to work together, um, especially to make pass legislation about, the, for example, the granting of land to Marius uh, veterans, the, um, let's say, the increase in power also, you know, of, of the knights over the, the senators, this kind of, um, also the, the agrarian uh, issue, the distribution of, of wheat um, to the plebs, these were very old populistic uh, kind of moves, um, and especially for the control of the city of Rome. And so th these two figures were kind of minor, but they were riding that uh, more extremistic fringe of populistic extremism. Um, and Marius was, um, let's say, considered that he was a, a consul still. So the, the thing was not seen as, um, you know, uh, so lightly because he was essentially the most important figure uh, in Rome at that point. So uh, supporting this fringe was, uh, was considered carefully by, by everyone. Um, the op to the opposition that his um, say that these proposals unleashed, Saturninus used to respond with violence, raising the crowd into turmoil. This is also typical of the late Roman Republic, since the assassination of the same tribunes of the plebs. There had been a, a flaring of, of, of violence in Rome. Um, the city was ever larger and ruled by the various uh, corporations that had their armored retinues. Um, there was not really much that uh, the Senate could um, do just by purely uh, military mean, because first of all, it was not legal to use any um, army in in Rome. Uh, actually. You know, during the, the wars between Marius and Sulla, this would would be um, would be done instead. But they hadn't arrived to that point. There, there were just some police forces and so on. But very often the people was uh, was quite quite uh, dangerous. Um, especially Rome always had historically this thing you know, that it, its population has always been extremely rough. They 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 controlled the entire. You see, these mobs controlled the entire supply lines of the city. They, they were vital for the same um, imperial government. So it was really a great risk, a vital one. And the thing was becoming really upsetting. 
uh, Glaucia, tribune of the plebs in 101, um, again, um, uh, essentially distanced himself further from, from the senators. Uh, it assigned to the knights the Quaestio de Repetundis, that was a very important court that was to examine the abuses of the Roman magistrates. Um, and um, especially uh, the ones operating in the provinces where, in fact, uh, the, the, the establishment uh, was pretty, pretty corrupt and, you know, away from um, the, more di you know, the, the more direct Roman, let's say, public uh, opinion. Um, and the, the Repetundis went back and forth, famously enough, uh, in uh, 106, Caipio had, for example, attributed it to a senatorial jury, thus well representing the antagonism between the senators and the uh, the equestrians. But in, in this kind of more the nobiliar establishment versus the uh, the provincial aristocracies that also were rising consistently in power, as Marius himself uh, proved. Um, so. As you understand, there are deeply intertwined issues in all this. It's the Italic question, it's the uh, recruitment question, so how much power can be uh, given to single generals, and thus this impacts the same effectiveness of, of, of Rome, right? And her deterrent power and uh, the, the functionality, the function of her empire and grip on other populations. Uh, and um, also the, the social divide uh, that was increasing and that would bring to rebellions that we say they were slave rebels but actually you know many many Roman citizens participated to that the same Spartacus revolt we think there was the, the revolt of the gladiators who wanted to be free uh, and all this bullshit uh, this was about the, there were lots of Roman citizens within that it was actually kind of a civil war between Romans um, and these aspects are often not um, not pointed out, um, and um, and so it was also a matter of you know realizing that the institutions couldn't quite bear, uh, or at least were barely bearing all the uh, you know the, the cause of this friction uh, at the with the only. Uh, alternative of, of collapsing as it would start happening exactly in Marian times with the war with Sulla and so on. Now at the court of Saturninus in 100 BC began with another agricultural initiative in favor of Marius veterans. Um, that's why also these men would were so supportive of the generals because of course and, uh, and how consequently successful uh, how dangerous successful generals really were because the um, uh, new policy was also uh, uh, as you understand all one with the extension of rights to to other populations right even though we're talking about Roman colonies still we're looking at the foundation of these in uh, in, in the provinces um, and thus the necessity of the uh, of the Senate to share power with provincial aristocracies. Um, so a bit all the crisis of Rome and this kind of reactionary attitude from the side of, of the conservative Senate also towards the extension of citizenship and so on was, was actually crippling the same expansion of Roman power. So these kind of broader popular policy Marius Caesar and even the most enlightened Julio Claudian emperors and that eventually became kind of the norm exactly because there was an emperor there that had made the thing becoming monarchic at the end of the day um, what is the entire meaning if you want of the Roman Empire in an expansionistic sense as as you, you understand. And the records were eager to support these ambitions because they knew that uh, if their patron was victorious, they would have been rewarded with lands and they would have also put their military expertise in service 
uh, again, as it happened with the Avvocati, famously enough, in many, many instances where the Roman army was becoming professional, so also retired troopers could be called back again with, with a military experience that um, was becoming the one of true, of true professionals as opposed to the idea of the citizens, um, of the citizen soldier, the peasant a soldier that in theory has just to go back living as a farmer and not much else. Again, th this latter thing is kind of an idyllic um, abstraction. It never existed in, in Roman history like in any other history, but um, it still kind of was, um, uh, if you want, it was even more functional for an individual. Surely at a point uh, before all these men, uh, you know, remained with some kind of wealth they could even provide with a better equipment you don't have to think for example that the modern reform brought in necessarily any greater kind of um, let's say of quality of equipment very often we can't think that the republican armies but especially the one of citizen was even more heavily equipped in a sense um, uh, whereas later given that collective training was everything also equipment surely was very good but not necessarily heavier um, or more in that sense individually designed and, than we think. The important was very often levying large masses of professionally trained troops and uh, those are effective even if they are kind of relatively less equipped. It's, it's a bit like saying the Atlantic hoplite of classical times as opposed to the Macedonian phalangite of, of later times. The, the phalangite is, is, is lighter in equipment Right, because his effectiveness is, is the one of the of the of the collective formation function, uh, and uh, so uh, it's a bit the same thing. Even though the Romans, of course, maintained a bit this kind of individualistic, uh, barbarian, Italic background bias, for which they were actually very, very aggressive fighters all throughout all their their. Uh, their existence and as we were saying before don't think that after all we're talking about extremely different people from places like the Italian Peninsula or Central or Northern Europe at a point it's it's the fact that the, the, the first had a state which you know the others didn't so um, never underestimate the power of civilization because anti satellism is a is a is a is the fruit of a of a deep misunderstanding of of how tradition can live within modernity itself, and that you know basically all the great powers in the world are the sum of this, and not the denial of you know an order of an authority or taxes or or wars or, or all this bullshit. It, it, this is exactly the identity of all those peoples who went under for good, right? And so who stops? fighting, who stops uh, going at war out there, who stops um, uh, paying taxes, loses, right? Civilization is based on knowing how to make war f well, uh, subjugating other peoples and civilizing them and to expand further. This is a civilization, right? Not abortions of, you know, second world countries that can't even make a war in the third millennium or you know paranoid um, isolationists that are f full of money but they're not willing to pay even a cent for you know expanding their power for um, these two types of systems crumble right? and and you can see this aspect within the the history of the Roman so-called Republic because the the, the, the recruitment crisis was fundamentally about this and Rome's greatness is the one the surpassing of that impasse fact um, now speaking we're talking about Saturninus well to, to block the oligarchic opposition the tribune added the close this reform um, in favor of you know uh, uh, donations uh, land plots to, to the Marian legionnaires that uh, obliged the, the senators to swear by the respect of this law. And this was designed by Marius specifically to oblige 
Quintus Caecilius Metellus Numidicus that he had a cat as a rival in uh, having effectively stripped him of the command of Numidia and succeeding where he had uh, you know yet not uh, himself um, to, to swear to right and that uh, would have equated to a uh, to a blackmail which either he recognized Marian authority or he quite likely could have not been uh, could have not stayed in Rome that's it and in fact again remember that Saturninus could mobilize this angry violent aggressive mobs that were extremely risky if you lived in the city it would be taken out uh, it was full of assassinations all around by the way so um, as we will see and this would always oh, kind of always turn in a word and another also against those who use this, this, the same methods well Quintus Caecilius Metellus Numidicus preferred exile to oath which is quite uh, quite mean um, this refusal brought to tensions that r resulted in the popular mass um, led by Saturninus and Glaucia to flow into Rome pushed into urban fights and battles uh, also by conflicting interests among each other the herbs plebs for example were opposed to the rural proletarians largely represented by soldiers and didn't like them much because they wanted to maintain say a, a grip on Rome that would have not had to, to be challenged even by you know potential again private armies that would in decades mar march on Rome um, and they knew that mechanism um, the italics were involved um, also in Saturninus agrarian proposals uh, arousing the jealousies of the same Roman city proletariat uh, that was not involved in, uh, in in military affairs most of the times as the Romans had gradually these were you know also clients of, uh, of influent uh, influent aristocrats at a time and these didn't want to pay too much so the italics had as, as you know traditionally supplied with the largest amount of records for the Roman army um, so also the, the italics there were always guided by the elites kind of pushing for s full citizenship as you know um, so Saturninus lack of scruples exceeded the limit uh, when to favor Glaucia who was running for the consulate for 99 BC found nothing better than to have the rival candidate assassinated right uh, this went on was also the killing of Memnius in that video about Saturninus I, I talk about that so uh, really a lot of violence going on ambushes in the city also uh, outside of it um, gladiators used um, as essentially uh, you know troopers in in the uh, in this uh, street battles um, so a very bloody situation where the the police and the senators also had their own clients and so this uh, fight escalated with great distress as you know for, for the world political social life in Rome that controlled it was the, the center of the empire so there was a lot at stake so at this point Marius was in a delicate position because he had as we've seen previously let's say used Saturninus uh, for uh, affirming his position in Rome but such situation now was was escaping uh, the senatorial control and Marius was the consul after all so he didn't really want to break with uh, the Senate because his ambition was just to you know fully be included with, with his family in the, in the establishment at a point to be uh, remembered also in that guise as you know Sulla had a, a very different kind of almost monarchic ideal 
uh, and he would become dictator and so on. We will see these things better in, in another video. Um, but he realized uh, that he had to, to abandon Saturninus. Right, uh, he also hadn't even at least di directly supported uh, the demagogues at this point that instead were pursuing, by the way, their own personal policy. Saturninus also had a, a great ambition. These were brutal, radical policies. And th these were actually also very shrewd players in the political scenario. It's just that their status, uh, their role, um, you know, was, was very different from the one again as individuals like Marius himself. Um, and as a consequence, the uh, the establishment commissioned Marius by um, Senatus Consultum Ultimum to restore public order. The Senatus Consultum Ultimum is basically the extrema ratio, that is to say the last uh, senatorial consultation, which practically meant that the consul at that point was entrusted with the task of repressing dissent regardless of the guarantees to Roman city rights. That is to say, whoever opposed himself, the consul had the, the senatorial green light to massacre uh, anyone in the process. And, and uh, so uh, Marius, uh, and the consul had that specific function. He had to repress the riots. He had to display the full military power of Rome in that context. So much that he succeeded, even in this kind of nightmarish Roman, urban, you know, environment, uh, to uh, repress the riots and force Saturninus and Glaucia to take refuge in the Capitolium. This was quite symbolical because it was the, the, the proper head of Rome. Uh, Marius at this point played a very interesting card. Um, that is to say, uh, he wanted to save face by a certain degree, given that um, this man had been the same ones who had supported him and had taken care of his veterans. Um, but at the same, and so, you know, killing them directly would have somewhat denied also his own ambitions. At the same time, however, the sin, he had, uh, uh, in fact, obeyed the Senate, that context could not turn against it as well. So given that there was a pretty uh, thick crowd of angry adversaries of Saturninus and, and Glaucia outside the capital, he likely uh, let them enter it uh, and exterminating them. Uh, so getting rid of, of the problem at the root. This was a, a very you know, sensible thing to do after all. And there's a deeper meaning because as we will see now with Marius' religion, this was a sort of, you know, you, you wanna ride the chthonic wave of, of the people, of the, in fact, the Pelasgian, uh, uh, it's a chaotic, irrational, uh, feminine force of of the masses of the plebs, you have to be, um, you know, able to really withstand their force as well. And uh, this, the, the the strength of the mass now had to turn against the same extremistic populists and had literally torn them into pieces, gotten devoured by the same overprotective mother, you know, swallows actually her children uh, in the process, you know, great ferocity. Uh, this episode was extremely serious, however, and so also M Marius' reputation, in a sense, was stained by it because he had definitely been blowing on fire uh, in, in in the previous years, um, and the Senate had been extremely wary of him. Uh, the Senate, in fact, repealed Saturninus' legislation as it had been passed through violence, literally 
you know, sending this uh, armed mobs to threaten the life of the voters uh, in the forum and public speakers. And objectively, the situation was obscene and untenable. Um, as a consequence, this kind of populistic uh, faction, which tended, as we've seen, to favor the knights in an anti-senatory guise, was uh, then abandoned even by the equestrians themselves, uh, which, uh, in fact, preferred the traditional stability ensured by the Senate rather than this kind of violent revolutions. And in fact, the equestrians should never be seen in, in, in Roman social history as some sort of um, middle ground, uh, middle class alien to kind of senatorial ambitions. Actually, what they wanted was exactly to become senators, which uh, their ether on, you know, in, in the generations would bring them, in fact, to, to become. Just very often, they, again, they used the means that they had at their disposal. And uh, these were also similar to the same senatorial ones, except, again, the, the questions were becoming also very powerful, like, like the senators, something that had not existed, let's say. Well, it had always been there as a broader thing, but, you know, the knights had been born uh, mostly with this, in fact, military uh, privilege that uh, originally was embodied by the literal uh, equestrian force of Rome, considered that even in, you know, the, the think about Sulla's cavalry in Numidia, or the same Roman cavalry that uh, had outflanked the, uh, the, the Germans um, at, uh, at Aquae Sextiae, well, it's, it's really, um, th they were really there. Right, Rome, contrarily to, to to random opinion, had yes a few cavalry, but this cavalry was quite damn good, right? And the the, the Romans had a, put a great care in their cavalry. And they had a very good, really good one, um, and th th these were the men that embodied that policy. And of course, um, they despised uh, the populists uh, as much as they could. In fact. The same Marius, who was, again, likely an equestrian, um, uh, was hardly connected to the masses just because of personal sympathy. That we cannot know. So after these events, there's this episode that we were hinting at at the beginning, that is Marius uh, leaving Rome temporarily to go to Asia. He was not exiled but he preferred to do that, uh, under the pretext of fulfilling a vow at the Magna Mater, Acap Cubale, at Pessinus, in the Anatolian heartland. Now, this is a very interesting, um, in fact, action that has sparked also some historiographical tension, because the Magna Mater, as you know, is the Pelasgian Mediterranean Mater that was bit the symbol of the plebs, right, of the people that the Roman senators instead uh, despised and that they had subjugated as the virile Indo-European ultra-militaristic uh, rule and that that is also what the empire really shined off. Instead, the, the Pelasgian cults were, were dark and uh, negative and, um, in fact, feminine, etc. So, Marius going to Asia, there are people may say, oh, well, but, you know, Marius cared so much about Kubala, that, as you know, was this very ancient uh, female goddess and that uh, had a lot of power. And um, first of all, consider that uh, Kubala had already been integrated by the, the senatorial elite in the official, um, in fact, pantheon of the Roman uh, state religion, right? Uh, it was a mean uh, deemed necessary during the Second Punic uh, War when uh, the Romans, suffering all these de defeats against uh, Hannibal, thought that their previous imperialistic uh, and therefore Apollonian, uh, virile, uh, in, say, moral, religious, cultural investment had to be compensated by a Pelasgian goddess such as uh, the same ones with which 
mm, cultures like the Carthaginian ones were, were associated with, right? Um, the Carthaginians had also some kind of celestial symbolism, but were much more chthonic than Rome, that instead was this pure ultra kind of in the European uh, revolutionary power that had turned also other Indo-European peoples like the Sabines or close to Romans, etc., um, that had um, uh, somewhat instead inclined towards the lunar um, background, also Etruscanly influence, but not only, right, with this other context with the with the East via the Atlantic colonies and so on, into again the the Indo-European uh, celestial rule of the eagle. Etc. And um, the, we have explained somewhere else how this worked. Like the entire traditional ideology was based on the concept that the female element didn't have to be eliminated. On the contrary, it had to be tamed, possessed, and transfigured through male imperial domination. Um, and thus, the idea of Rome was exactly this one, and it can hardly be denied that Roman civilization derives exactly by this, that is to say, the subjugation of the barbarian, right? So, of the chthonic, earthly monster that can be strong and tall, but it's not really uh, intelligent and morally superior like the hero. This, this is uh, an idea shared by all the, the Indo European mythology. Um, whereas, this other Mediterranean populations um, so had not quite, um, but they were based on another principle. Um, and the, the same struggle was reflected again in the uh, senatorial aristocracy versus the plebs of Rome that in fact had much more feminine deities. Think about Charis, the, um, probably the deities of the, or the Liber Pater that was essentially very close to Dionysus. So also the you know the, the gods of the, the lowest instincts of the um of this dissolution of Ubris, right? So if you look at Indo European history you, you find always a blend of these uh, values. The same is is valid for the Pelasgian one. Uh in fact the same Kubele was um was a powerful goddess. She had some sort of military power. In fact, her daughter, Nicaea, is known by Dionysus exactly as a fierce warrior. So it's, it's a bit the same idea of, of the Amazons, right? And uh, the, the myth of the Zeus and the intervention of Apollo and Athena against the Arenas and so on. So the light that defeats the darkness, the, the virility that defeats the, the femininity. Um, and um, as a as a consequence, uh, you realize that many other Hellenistic powers, including the ones controlling Pessinus, such as the the Italids of Pergamon, uh, were living a bit within the the two um, realms in a sense. Rome and Pergamon had a special bond because um, the the Romans were according to legend, originally from Troy. And so this divine connection with the same lands that the Italians ruled and that brought, in fact, in Pergamon, that was, as you know, one of the most radically advanced um, cultural um, capitals of Hellenism, uh, studied the Italic antiquities at the time, and vice versa. The Romans were quite into uh, Pergamon's history. And there was a parallel there that could be traced in... Um, entrusting uh, uh, him, uh, himself, speaking of Marius, uh, to the Magna Mater during the fight against the Cimbrians and the Taurans and this other broader cent central northern European peoples, in the way the, um, the Italians had done while defeating the Celts in Asia Minor. In other words, um, uh, Marius was going to the east, also with other broader ambitions. First of all, to still hegemonize. Uh, you see, Pergamon had already been incorporated within uh, the Roman possessions in, in practice, uh, and um, the Italians also had simply given power to Rome. 
Um, and so what Marius probably went to Asia Minor for was probably to, pr to plan a, a further campaign, especially against uh, Mithridates, um, whom he also threatened and challenged in the sense that, you know, if you are, you have, because Pontus was being a bit bitchy with Rome and didn't like uh, the, um, the penetration of especially the, the equestrians in, in Asia Minor, etc., you know what would happen later. And so Marius told him allegedly either you, you know, you demonstrate to be stronger than Rome or you obey to her, which was the standard policy there. Um, so this uh, vow to the, the Magna Mater in a broader sense had to do with the, uh, the broader um, entrustment of, of, of the Romans uh, in, in a moment of emergency and difficulty that had played much in that proletarian sense, in favor of the Magna Mater, in fact, um, in, in, the, in the Marian reformistic policy, in the moment in which the Cimbri had threatened the same Italy, in this broader, you know, uh, say, further sunrise of Roman power, just as Marius had been defined the new Romulus, the new Camillus, as just Rome had done after the Second Punic War. And so Marius, with this symbolism, was not much, but we will never know about his personal sympathies towards the, the Apollonian or, or, or the Ctonic. Again, the fact that he was an equestrian actually doesn't mean that he was more of a necessarily of a Ctonic individual compared to senators. On the contrary, the, the Roman knights were radically obsessed with anything, uh, you know, militaristic, vir virile, in fact, mounted. Uh, Indo-European, celestial, and so on, um, but of course, there was some surely some tonic influence, but it, it it seemed to make leverage on this Roman traditional story again of the people that after all manages to confer um, Camillus, for example, with his reform, the manpower to crush the Gauls that had uh, plundered uh, Rome, um, according to the legion, and then and more so, um, the um, entire point was to just perform this kind of broader role, task, uh, and to uh, resume in, in his persona the, uh, the populistic uh, ambitions, right, uh, in front, again, of the masses that were the, s the same ones that had thus given power to him. Right. Consider that um, that kind of militaristic uh, ideal of, of the same Dionysian Ctonic principle was present uh, in the broader Roman obsession towards the East, right? Uh, as Westerners were reasoned mostly, in fact, in a Western-centric way as far as also as Rome is concerned, because we say we mostly focus on uh, the Germans, the Celts, and all these things, but telling the truth, those were secondary realities. Rome was... Um, traumatically obsessed and exalted and fanatically so to, to the extreme in the idea of taking over the entire East going beyond even the limits of Alexander expansion and the Dionysian connection also with Kubele and, uh, and her daughter etc. also in the Atalid tradition and so in, in the territory where where Marius had traveled to fulfill the vow to the vow to the same Kubele, embodied a bit that kind of ambition. It's a bit like Caesar with the Parthian expedition before he was assassinated. Um, uh, the you see Dionysus was was a bit the tamer of barbarians as well. There is in in that Ctonic religion to the idea that if you want to be a barbarian, you have to be a barbarian, a true barbarian. <laughs> you have to be uh, devoted to that full ubers that Dion Dionysus represents. And instead Dionysus in the legion invades India because uh, these people had not been fully under his um, control, there is all the legion of the of the chariot of victory, pulled by the the panthers that were the symbol of, you know, sexual um, uh, lack of limit. Let's say in the Dionysian uh, 
cults and also in this kind of priestly, you know, in Asia Minor it was also aphrodisias with, you know, sacred prostitution and this kind of thing. But th that tamed the Indians uh, because they had been unpierced, they had not fulfilled that kind of full entire Dionysian force. And this is a very interesting concept um, because it speaks of the need the civilizational need of some sort of provoking force uh, that is embodied by the left, if you want, is embodied by that populistic element that the superiority of, of human dignity has to crush and subjugate and transfigure and to, to turn into Apollonian light and reason and authority and discipline and force. Uh, that is what all these conquerors were seeking to do. And so Dionysus there was, was essentially teaching the Indians to be true Dionysian barbarians rather than anything in the myth. And Dionysus actually in that context uh, is Shiva himself, right? That's the actually the, the Vedic background, the same story, and the connection of Dionysus with India, because this was remembered as well. And so in the broader unity of, of the universe, you need the... Um, both the light and the darkness, and of course Shiva had been part of it, unavoidable of that religion in the moment in which the Veda had also uh, invaded uh, India, naturally. Uh, so th the broader concept there is that Marius was playing a role which was functional to that specific populistic politics, topping it, right? And the barbarians that are barbarians but not so good barbarians is embodied by the fact that in, in this Marian ideology even the Roman proletarian so again the one led by Liber Pater by eating, having sex, all the, the physical uh, things tames the the Cimbrian, the Teutons that were barbarians but let's say not so good barbarians like the like the Roman ones right and and so maybe Marius was fully in love with the Apollonian principle, but he wouldn't say that because that was functional to his race to power, anyway. And it's dramatically important to stress, in my opinion, this, this mechanism, because um, it helps much more than any other historical datum, in my opinion, to interpret history at this point, um, and to restore properly the meaning of civilization, even in its most subtle but never banal aspects. Um, and in the concept that, of course, civilization is never a relative thing. There's not two different truths or multiple or infinite different truths um, in the world. There is just one truth, right? So there is always a people that's, that is a better than another. Uh, and um, there is no way uh, to simply say, well, this is not true because I feel more for this or that doesn't mean anything. It means you're a barbarian if you think like that. And you deserve to be subjugated. And this is the easiest principle that Western civilization has beautifully illustrated throughout all her history. And that is the only means to easily make, given especially the background from which Western civilization comes compared to any other, to be r ruling the world easily and again. Um, and so this um, aspect is uh, particularly important. Um, we will keep exploring it also in the history of religion. However, I stop it here. Just hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please share it. Otherwise, leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content. And for now, I thank you heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time and see you next time.